Thank you so much uh, for coming tonight, and um, thank you especially to um, the Houston Museum and especially to the Leakey Foundation for um, inviting me here. Um, tonight I will share with you some of the findings on the chimpanzees that I study and why I think this should indeed make us rethink some of our theories about the earliest members of our evolutionary lineage. Now I think probably most of you have heard that chimpanzees are our closest living relatives. We share at least 98% of our genetic makeup with chimpanzees and bonobos, their sister species, but maybe what you didn't know is that we're also their closest living relative. So chimpanzees are more closely related to humans than they are to gorillas. And this is one reason that I and other scientists, primatologists and paleoanthropologists, look to chimpanzees for clues regarding the evolution of our, our own lineage. So I'm a biological anthropologist, and many of the questions I address with my research are done in an attempt to better understand human or hominid bipedal ape evolution. So while I'm interested in chimpanzees for their own sake, I'm also interested in what they can tell us about human evolution. This is a nice photo by Franz Lanting of National Geographic. This is a chimp that we call Juf. I don't know if you can tell, but he's got a very large rock in his hand. He's going bipedal there, and that's one thing that we study. And one way with it that we do learn more about our heritage is to understand the differences that set us apart from other beings, specifically what's unique to our own lineage. And I believe that learning more about our closest living relatives can do this. So what can apes tell us that fossils cannot? So this is a cartoon of some apes shaking the, the family tree there. And anthropologists have long recognized that the study of living primates can give us insight into how members of our own lineage adjusted and adapted to specific situations. I want to go back. Sorry about that. Couldn't, couldn't move on past Lewis and Mary and Lucy, who you should be familiar with. Um, Lewis Leakey, as you just um, heard in the film, is a very famous paleoanthropologist who recognized the utility of studying living apes. And while he is credited, along with Mary and a number of other Leakeys, with amazing fossil finds, he was also instrumental in initiating the study of great apes in the wild. You also saw these three young women in the film, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and Baruti Galdikas, who Lewis helped initiate studies on chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, respectively. In fact, in a now famous response to a wire sent to Lewis by Jane Goodall, when she told him of her observations that chimpanzees indeed use tools to termite fish, Lewis responded, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as human. One of my favorite quotes of all time, I think. And he was referring to the fact that until then, anthropologists and others had thought that humans were the only beings, the only animals that used tools. And we know now that a number of different animal species are regular tool users, not only chimpanzees, but other animals as well. But this is an example of a process that continues today, where as we learn more about other species, we continue to redefine ourselves, redefine what it means to be human. And in fact, we probably know more about chimpanzees than any other wild animal on this earth. And this map shows you a number of long-term chimpanzee studies in East Africa, Central and West Africa. Some, such as the Gombe site initiated by Jane Goodall with the assistance of Lewis Leakey, have been ongoing now for almost 50 years. In fact, you might think of this when you think of chimpanzees. I do, actually. But, in fact, we know very little about chimpanzees outside of, West, uh, outside of East Africa, in a sense. And the sites that are left here on the map are sites that 
um, where research has been done or is ongoing on chimpanzees in Central Africa and West Africa, with the exception of the asterisk site in Senegal that was um, initiated and abandoned in the 1970s. These four are the only long-term chimpanzee study sites outside of East Africa. And additionally, we know very little about chimpanzees outside of forested habitats, and that's the focus of my own study. I initiated the Fongoli chimpanzee study site approximately eight years ago, and the chimpanzees here live in a very different type of environment than the chimpanzees that have been studied elsewhere. They live in a savanna. This is not a chimpanzee, it's a baboon. But early on in anthropological primatology, we focused on studies of baboons because baboons live in a savanna habitat and it was thought that they could give us some insight into the evolution of our own species in this type of habitat. And so we know actually quite a bit regarding how monkeys behave in this type of habitat. But until I was able to habituate chimpanzees at Fongoli, which took four years, we didn't know how apes reacted to this type of habitat. Chimpanzees had only been studied in forested areas. So this is a, a typical shot of chimpanzees at my site. These are three adult males, and they just crossed um, a grassland habitat. And in the background, you can see a woodland. This is during the dry season, but the early dry season. So at the end of the dry season, you won't see any green leaves on the trees, and fires will have burned through the area. And so basically many of these, especially plateau areas, look sort of like the surface of the moon, or at least that's what we think as we walk across them in very hot weather. And that's another stress that the chimpanzees have to deal with here, where they don't, um, that they don't deal with elsewhere. These chimps experience temperatures of over 115 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. Um, and Houston knows heat, I would say, but this is a very hot climate for chimpanzees. It's hot for us as well. There's very little shade, and you can imagine that water is very scarce. And in fact, many, if not all of the differences that I'll highlight tonight, differences between chimpanzees at my site and chimpanzees elsewhere, can be tied back into this very unique environment. So when I began my research, I did so with the goal as an anthropologist of trying to better understand the evolution of our own species. And to do this, we need to understand the differences between ourselves and others. In the scientific sense, these differences are the most informative. They tell us about ancestor-descendant relationships. But in fact, some of the differences, or sorry, some of the similarities we see are the ones that people seem to be most interested in. Similarities between ourselves and others where we once thought we were, in fact, unique. In a sense, it's natural that we focus on these differences. It's something that is typical of perhaps our society and of Western science in particular, but it's not typical of all cultures. And these are people I work with in Senegal. They see themselves very differently. They see themselves as part of nature. And in fact, this is one of the reasons I was successful in habituating the chimpanzees at Fongoli. People in Senegal do not hunt chimpanzees for food. They consider them to be close human relatives. So while other primates, monkeys like this paddis monkey, baboons, and vertebrate monkeys are eaten by certain people in the area, chimpanzees are not. And there are up to four or five different groups of people that live alongside chimpanzees at Bongoli, and each of them incorporate chimpanzees as well as other primates into their folklore. I'll give you one example of one of these folk tales that explains the origin of chimpanzees and their close relation to humans. So in this photo you see on the left, my neighbor Edward, and Edward is a teenage boy, and he's about to go through a circumcision ceremony. It is a very important ceremony for him. It initiates him into adult society, and he's helping his uncle, Kali, on the right, and usually Kali dresses like Edward does, but in this photo he's preparing to serve as the spiritual or symbolic spiritual guide of Edward. And in the Basari folktale, 
There were a number of boys who were afraid to go through a circumcision ceremony. You can imagine why. That would be a little scary for a boy this age. And they ran off into the woods, and over time they became chimpanzees. And I always apologize because I tell that not very eloquently at all, and if I was Vasari, I would tell it much, much better, but that's the gist of it. Um, and so this is, is interesting because it is, uh, is symbolic for these youngsters, so boys and girls, to be initiated into adult society. Chimpanzees are not considered quite adult, but yet they are considered to be closely related to humans. And this is why I believe that I have been successful. So chimpanzees, while they're still afraid of humans, besides my research team, they um, aren't hunted by them. They don't consider them to be predators. So life on the savannah. My main research question, again, has to do with the effects of this type of environment on chimpanzee behavior. And while I don't assume, assume that chimpanzees living today are replicas of our own ancestors, I, I think that we have good reason to look to them for clues. Among all animals living today, they are our closest living relatives. And that leads us to think that their reactions and adaptations will be more similar to our own, or to that of our own ancestors. And learning how they respond to these stresses associated with a savanna environment can help us come up with hypotheses and questions, perhaps new directions about the evolution of our own lineage. So a little bit about the findings from Fongoli. You can imagine that a big issue for chimpanzees in this habitat is heat. So how do chimpanzees cope with heat? Humans actually have some very unique ways of dealing with heat stress. In some ways, we're very different from other types of primates. And we think this was especially important as our lineage began to move from a more closed environment to a more open environment, and to a savanna mosaic. At Bongoli, we see how apes deal with stress. They soak. And this is probably a little more amazing for those of you who are familiar with chimp behavior because based on Jane Goodall's work, especially, we thought for years that chimps were basically hydrophobic, that they were afraid of water. Since then, we've seen at other sites that they'll cross bodies of water to get to fruit, for example, but they don't really love it. At my site, they love water. And you can imagine that once the rain set in but the temperature has not fallen, so you have high heat and humidity, this is not um, perhaps surprising that they spend so much time in water. So this is a favorite pool of theirs, and I have a video that I'll show at the end of the talk, and you'll see these males. Um, this is the Kodo pool, and you'll actually see males fight over access to the pool. They actually don't fight the, the dominance hierarchy, sort of take care of that, but it's a good place to sit and watch social interactions. And on the far right is a young female who probably won't gain access to the water for a while. Another way that they deal with heat is to use caves. And when I first arrived at Fongoli, my older field assistant told me that the chimps use caves, and I thought that sounds too good to be true. But in fact, they do. And it was years before we could actually see them use caves because, again, it took four years to habituate them. But we swept the caves, and then we collected data on chimpanzee knuckle prints and tracks and chimpanzee hairs and things like that. And I measured temperatures in these various habitats, the caves, as you would suspect, are always cooler and they're um, pretty stable in temperature. And now we can observe the chimpanzees go, go into these small caves, they're more like rock shelters, and they'll groom in there, they'll sleep in there during the hottest time of the day, and only during the dry season, not during the wet season. And they'll actually take food in there, take branches with fruits and things like that into these caves. And this again was something that hadn't been seen in chimpanzees elsewhere. A major stress for chimpanzees at my site are these seasonally occurring bushfires. So some of these fires are natural and others are set by people that want to clear their land for crops, things like this. But it's a natural part of the chimpanzees' environment. And this to me is very interesting because the use of fire is a major question in human origin research. In fact, some scholars maintain that our use of fire is as unique as our spoken language in setting us apart from other animals. A big question is, though, when did our control and use of fire begin? 
Now, it's generally thought that animals are afraid of fire for good reason. And again, I think the Bongoli chimps can provide us some insight into how apes behave when they're confronted with this type of stress. And chimps in Senegal are able to predict the movement of fire, the behavior of fire, if you want to call it that. In fact, they're much better than I am at predicting the behavior of fire. I'm quite afraid when the fire comes close. And they'll basically wait until this wall of fire gets within, I'd say, um, 30 or 40 feet of them, and then they'll move. And they're very good at predicting the direction. I'm bad at predicting the direction of fire, so I stick with them and I do what they do. <laughs> and um, the reason I think this is important is because if you think about, you know, chimpanzees are pretty clever. Um, we know they're very intelligent. Um, but if you look at their brain size, their brain is only about the quarter of the size of our own brain. And this is something in paleoanthropology that's used as a proxy for intelligence, brain size. Now, if you look at the earliest bipedal hominids, relative to chimpanzees, their brain was even a little bit larger. Now, if we use that as a measure of intelligence, perhaps, then if these chimpanzees are able to predict the movement of fire, then perhaps we should think about the possibility that early hominids were able to control fire as well. Tool use. Anthropologists have always been interested in tool use since Jane first discovered that man is not the only tool maker. And almost every chimpanzee population that has been studied exhibits some sort of tool use. And Fogoli is no exception. We have a wide variety of tool use behavior. And this photo is an adult male that we call Mamadou, and he's termite fishing. This was the first behavior that Jane reported to, to Louis Leakey when he sent back that famous telegram. In fact, I have a PhD student who's completing her work and she has found that chimps at my site termite fish more than chimpanzees at any other site. They do so throughout the year, not just during the rainy season. And again, I think this ties back into their climate and the fact that there's a lack of protein during the, the dry season. And there are other types of tool use as well. You've already um, seeing Jeff with his stone, and some people consider that a form of tool use. They throw stones during displays, including sometimes at observers, if we're not careful. And in the lower left photo, you see what's called baobab fruit smashing, and it's a form of percussive technology. The Leakey Foundation, in addition to funding my own research on tool use and other aspects of behavior, funded a PhD student who worked at my site from Slovenia, and she studied percussive technology in chimpanzees, specifically regarding this type of hard fruit, the baobab fruit. And the chimpanzees use anvils, not hammer stones, but anvils to smash open these fruits. And this is what this juvenile male is doing in the lower left, smashing open a baobab fruit. But probably the most exciting type of tool use that we've seen at Fongoli is hunting with tools. And so on that upper left photo, you see a little chimp that we call Frito. And he is in the process of poking a spear-like tool into a hollow. Besides tool use, another thing anthropologists have always paid much attention to is hunting and meat-eating. And that's because, again, humans were long viewed as unique among primates regarding their hunting behavior. In fact, many anthropologists believe this is part of what has made us human. And again, due or because of Jane Goodall's studies and those of others, we know that chimpanzees regularly hunt other mammals, including monkeys. But as I mentioned, the chimpanzees at my site hunt small mammals, but they use tools to do so. And this is something that hasn't been seen before. And here you see a chimp that we call Bowie. He's got a vervet monkey. Besides using tools, the other unique aspect of this type of behavior is that it's not the adult males that are doing it. In fact, females exhibit this behavior more often than males, and young chimpanzees also exhibit this behavior at a higher frequency. And here you have Tumbo with a persimian or a bush baby prey that she's obtained, obtained with a tool. So I'll talk a little bit more about this type of behavior. And so we've observed male chimpanzees at Fungoli behave like chimps elsewhere. They hunt monkeys. And we now know that they hunt all the different primates at the site, all the non-human primates. 
So baboons, vervet monkeys, patus monkeys. Um, for your vervet fans, I apologize, but there's a vervet on the, the right and a vervet on the left, the before and after photo. Um, um, an adult male has captured a vervet monkey, and then for the first time this past summer, I observed the chimpanzees catch, um, kill, and eat a patus monkey, and that's the orange monkey there in the upper left, and this is the first time that chimpanzees have been observed to hunt patus monkeys, partly because there's no other site where chimpanzees coexist with patus monkeys. They're a savanna-dwelling monkey. And also, this is quite a feat because patus are the fastest primates. And I will tell you, though, that Subaru caught the patus monkey in the tree. And once the monkeys hit the ground, the chimps just gave up. Stop. It's cold. But um, this is a behavior that's not unlike chimpanzee behavior at other sites. Males use even coordinated behavior to hunt monkeys. But again, hunting with tools is different. So there have been about three observations total of chimpanzees elsewhere hunting with tools, and these come from two different sites. But here it's really systematic, and it's regular, and it's seasonal. And so I'll just describe the process to you. Again, I have a before and after photo. Sorry for you Prosimian fans, but there's a little bush baby in the upper left, a very small Prosimian primate, and there's Tumbo with her bush baby after. And these primates are nocturnal. They're very small, about the size of a guinea pig, I think, I'd say. And they sleep in hollows during the day, so hollow branches and hollow trunks. What the chimpanzees do is they break off a live branch. They'll, break off all, they'll strip off all the leaves from the branch. They usually break off the terminal end, so the smallest end, which makes the tool more sturdy. And then certain individuals will actually peel off all the bark, including Tumbo. And they'll even sharpen the tip with their teeth. And Tumbo, again, shown here, is one of the females that exhibits this behavior. It's a very systematic process that they go through. And then they take the tool and they'll stab it down into the hollow. And hopefully for them, and not for the bush babies, they'll get a bush baby. So, sorry about the graph, but I'll update you a little bit on our sample size. So here you see pink is for girls and blue is for boys. Um, the hot pink, those are adult females. So each bar represents a different Kwangoli chimpanzee. The dark blue bars represent adult males. So when we published our study initially in 2007, we had a sample size of around 22. And now we have over 50 instances of tool assisted hunting recorded. Again, females and amateurs exhibit this behavior at higher rates than males based on their presence in social groups the likelihood that they will be seen to exhibit this behavior, and also because of the fact that males are better habituated than females. So there are still some females that are fairly shy around human observers. These top female hunters aren't. So I imagine that I'm missing quite a bit of female hunting behavior because of these shy older females. And I'll talk more about these, these top female hunters in a minute. But I do want to say something about the males. And so you see those dark blue bars refer to these adult males. Only one of those adult males has ever exhibited the behavior more than once. And I think I've got a pretty good handle on male behavior. I focus on males specifically, so when I do my studies, I follow one male all day long, and next day I'll follow another male all day long. So of course I'm not getting every single thing that they do, but I have thousands of hours of male behavior. I observe females when they're in parties with males opportunistically, so I can see them if they happen to be in the vicinity of my subject and they hunt. I usually drop everything and run over there and start collecting behavior. But I think I have a pretty good handle on average male behavior. We have seen an increase. So when we first published this study, one male exhibited this behavior, a young male. And now we have five. And when I was asked about this, when it first came out, um, I was asked whether I thought it was a new behavior or one that had been around and we just hadn't seen it. I said, it's probably been around. We haven't seen it. We just habituated the chimpanzees. Now we've been watching them for four years systematically. So it's probably been around and we're just now observing it. No one had observed savannah chimps. But what you see is a pattern that um, is similar to, to this type of learning curve or learning behavior we see in primate groups. So in primate groups, adult females and immatures usually pick up a new behavior fairly quickly. And adult males are the, the social, uh, the age sex class that picks up the behavior last. So, um, if this continues to occur, if I see more males exhibiting this behavior, then I'll reconsider 
whether or not this is, in fact, a new behavior that is just now making its way to those adult males. So these are the three top female hunters at Fongoli. And within the past two years, they've each given birth to their very first offspring. So one thing I'm very excited about is being able to observe these infants and see how they learn the behavior or do not learn the behavior. And that um, will be, say, maybe five or ten years down the road since chimpanzees are so long lived. These infants will be weaned for another three or four years. But so that's an exciting um, area that we'll continue to focus on. And I guess one last thing I want to say about this type of behavior, and I'd be happy to answer questions about it after the talk, but this again is a behavior that can be tied into the environment, although it might not seem like it on the surface. At most other chimpanzee sites, chimpanzees ignore bush babies. They're available as prey, but they're ignored. The thing is that chimpanzees prefer red colobus monkeys, which is a fairly large monkey, but red colobus don't occur at Fongoli. It's just too hot and dry for this type of monkey to live there. And so what I see here is that Fongoli chimps are getting creative um, in order to get the protein that they need. A new area of study for me, and something that again seems unique about the Fongoli chimps, is the fact that they're more cohesive than chimpanzees that have been studied in forested environments. And perhaps somewhat more like bonobos, if you're familiar with those apes. So chimpanzees live in a fission-fusion society where you have a community of individuals that know one another, but they subgroup. And so you might be with someone for a day or for an hour or for a number of days, but they subgroup into smaller groups. And it's a very fluid social organization. And Fongoli chimps are like that for the most part. But they have larger parties, we call them, or subgroups on average. And they also spend their time together as a community during certain times of the year. So they'll move around this very large home range together. Their home range is up to nine times larger than chimpanzees elsewhere. And in part, I think that they stick together because of their social nature. And this has led me to looking more specifically this year at social behavior, social organization, and specifically social behavior. So with this cohesiveness seems to come a level of tolerance that's not typical of chimpanzees elsewhere. And again, trends towards what we see in bonobos. So right now we're working on a study of sharing. And chimpanzees share meat, and this is actually a photo of two chimpanzee males. And so the male on your right actually has a mouthful of vervet monkey. And the male on your left is begging a piece of meat from him. And this is a typical way of chimpanzee, the way that chimpanzees beg. They basically, he almost takes it out of his mouth. And chimpanzees are very tolerant when they beg. Um, they're very tolerant of beggars. They also often ignore beggars. So a chimpanzee may sit very close to another, basically very close to their face, but, are, but is ignored. Chimpanzees at all sites share meat. That's something that has been observed for a very long time. Again, Jane Goodall observed this. But what is different here is that we see plant food sharing, and specifically that males allow females to take food from them. Now, plant food, rare, plant food sharing is rare among chimpanzees in general, but Males here allow chimps to allow female chimps to take food, and actually, in one case, a male appeared to make tools for a female. So he would make a termite fishing tool while he was sitting next to her while she fished. Um, she would finish her tool after a while; they get a little worn. She would discard it, take his tool, and he would repeat the process over and over again. So there's some interesting male-female relationships that occur here that again are more, 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 more reminiscent of bonobos. And in fact, though, may be more typical of West African chimps, because for a very long time we've depended on East African chimps to sort of generalize chimpanzees. And another form of sharing is female meat sharing. Females hunt here, and they don't hunt at other sites very much at all. In fact, females account for half of the hunting of bush babies. Most of the other hunting is done by immature males and then a little bit by adult males. And then females 
are responsible for about one third of prey capture. So while females don't hunt monkeys, they definitely hunt bush babies, and it seems that they hunt bush bucks, or at least capture bush buck fawns. And this allows us to look at female sharing. And it's, again, a difference that you see at Fungoli. Females are allowed to keep their prey, and this is not always the case. The prey can be taken from them. The, the chimpanzee you see on the right here is an adult female that we call Farafa, and her infant daughter Fanta is there in the foreground. Fanta's a little angry right there because there's a, an adolescent male who's coming up. He'd like to have some meat, but Farafa refuses him. In fact, I've seen Farafa ignore the alpha male when she has a, a bit of bushbuck meat. And so females are not only allowed to, to keep the prey that they hunt, but they can effectively ignore even the highest ranking male. And this is something that we're focusing on right now. So why share? And again, this is explained at some level by the type of environment they exhibit and the fact that they exhibit a more cohesive social unit. And you saw in the previous film, Richard Rangham talked about lethal aggression in chimpanzees. And so in East Africa specifically, what you see is that Chimpanzees from, very, from different communities will actually gang up on individuals from another community and kill them. And Richard talked about that being a characteristic typical of only chimpanzees and humans for the most part in the animal kingdom. Otherwise, it's fairly rare. Well, we have, we have not seen that here in Senegal. In fact, it seems to be fairly rare um, in West Africa in general. So again, I think the study of, of the Fongoli chimps helps us not only to understand our own evolutionary history, but to help redefine chimpanzees and to put the behavior of East African chimpanzees in perspective. Now I want to talk about a special case here. Um, empathy is a trait that many people think is unique to humans. And I have an interesting example of empathy that I'd like to share with you. This ties into, I think, the, the social nature, the cohesiveness of the Fongoli community. I'm going to show you a little video if I can get it to play. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was contacted by my field assistant. I was back in Iowa. I'd been over there in Senegal um, during our holiday break. And my field assistant, Johnny, contacted me and he said, someone in town has a baby chimpanzee. People in town have a baby chimpanzee and I'm afraid she might be from our community. Now, I said that people in Senegal don't hunt chimps for food, but I've heard over the years that given the chance, people will try to get a baby to sell. So for the pet trade, and that's one reason why I don't focus on females. I follow males, but I don't target females like I do males. Well, I told Johnny to go back and take a photo of the infant. And it turns out that it was an infant from our community. This is Amy and Tia. The chimp that's on the, the leaky magnet for this year is the mother of Amy, and uh, Amy is Tia's first infant. There's Tia grooming with an adult male, adult male Karamoko. This is the photo of Amy that Johnny sent me. And so she was taken by hunters, and Johnny saw her the day after she was taken. He was able to talk the hunters into giving her to him. And so when he called me back Sunday morning, he already had Amy with him, and he was feeding her milk. She wouldn't take food from the hunters. They tried to give her bananas, but the chips at Fongoli don't know what bananas are. And she was also afraid. So Johnny fed her milk. He kept her in a cage. We decided to limit contact with her. She would have been much more at ease if he would have carried her around. They, they crave contact, but we wanted to limit contact because of the possibility of transmitting disease to her. Even a common cold could turn into pneumonia, to, into pneumonia quickly for Amy. And I'm going to show you a, a video on it, but I want to tell you about this guy first. Um, the video talks about, it basically has a, a little interview with me and I'll explain the return of Amy. Where I flew over to, to Senegal the Monday following that, so two days later, and we were able, able to locate the mother, and usually the mother is killed during this sort of in incident. Miraculously, Tia was alive. And we returned Amy, and you can see it a little bit in the video, but this guy up here, Mike the Adolescent, it came and retrieved Amy for her mother. So I'm going to see if I can try to play this video, and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about 
Mike's behavior specifically after this. On Saturday, actually, I got a call from him, and I thought it was just a normal update, and he Sorry. said that someone had a baby chimp in town, and he thought it might be from our group based on what they had told him. And I asked him details, and he said he was so bothered he didn't, you know, recognize the baby or anything. Plus, it's a very different view from what we're used to looking at. So he sent me, I, I sent him back to uh, to get the baby. He didn't have the baby yet. I said, well, it sounds like it's from our group, and what we'll do is introduce it back if we can, and some others still around, or if it's old enough to be introduced. And so he went back and took photos and called me the next day. By that time, I had bought my ticket and. Um, you know, with the assistance of, of folks that I would say, you know, department, our department chair named Apology, Paul Osley, and Mike Whiteford, um, had told me I could go, and so I was ready to go by that time, and, and he had then gotten the baby at that point. Once Johnny and I found the chest and we saw that Tia was there, I uh, literally ran back to camp, and he stayed with the chimp with a walkie-talkie, and I carried the baby back uh, almost until we got to the chimp, actually, where we heard the chimp vocalizing. And my other field assistant, Michelle, um, helped me put her into a sack, and so what we did then was to, our plan was to go and put the sack down quite a, a distance away from the chimp so that they wouldn't see us with the baby. Um, the thing was, though, this little baby was so tiny, so nine months of age, when we got there and the chimps were vocalizing, I, I turned and I asked Michelle what she was doing, and he said, if she didn't hear, bitch, the thing was, she was so young, I'm sure she did hear, but she didn't know what to do, and she doesn't give loud vocalizations like older chimps do, she gives tiny little vocalizations like babies do, and so there was no way for her to draw attention to herself, um, as she might if she was older, so we finally decided, the three of us together, um, for protection in case the chimps were, uh, you know, upset by the fact that we had the baby. But the three of us together would go and put the sack down as a group and then move back. I think still it's, it's, it's unbelievable because, for one thing, just the fact that Tia was alive um, and we were, and the baby is, was alive and both were in, the baby in better health than her mother, but both healthy enough to, to the point where I think they'll, they'll survive. And that was one thing, but then to have Mike come, the adolescent male, pick up the baby, and there was some screaming as the baby, you know, jumped into his arms, but I think that was more of excitement on the baby's part, and then it was so smooth, the Tia then was already coming down the tree from where she'd been feeding, and she came right away, Mike went right up to her, he's this adolescent male that came and got her, and she took the baby from him, and it was just unbelievably smooth, and I think all of us, it was almost this giddy feeling, but it was very emotional, <laughs> and, um, my bill system, the very first thing they said was, thank God. I mean, they just were so happy that it had happened like this. And none of us, literally, I, I almost couldn't ask for a better outcome, given, outcome given the circumstances that, that surrounded us. I'll, I'll tell you that Tia and Amy are doing well. So that was January 28th that we returned Amy to her mother. And um, I don't know if you could tell, but Tia was injured by the dogs, the hunter's dogs during this incident. We're sure that that's how this happened, is that the dogs treat Tia, and usually the chimps can get together and take care of dogs, but when the people came on the scene, then Tia must have been afraid and leapt from the tree and was attacked by dogs. And during that time, either the baby fell or was pulled off. She had an injury on her back that could have been a dog bite. And then her eye was injured, you saw in that one photo. When we returned her, her eye was much better. We had put some Visine in it. <laughs> and um, I was able to stay with the chimps for the rest of that day. And so my two field assistants went back to town for much deserved rest. And I followed Tia and Amy for the rest of the day. And at the, the end of the day, the chimps usually travel quite a bit, so for a couple of kilometers. And when they began to travel, Tia's wound opened and started bleeding again, flies came to it, and she would stop about every 30 meters and tend to the wound, wave it away, and when she did this, she would put Amy down, and then she would pick her back up again and repeat this process over and over. After a few minutes, Mike, that same adolescent male, came, picked up Amy, and carried her for Tia for the rest of the travel. And that was amazing to me. There's so many things about that incident that were amazing to me. Um, 
being such a, a horrible incident, it turned out just I couldn't hope for a better outcome. But that was something that was very unexpected. Adolescent males don't do that. And it was very almost bizarre to see Mike carrying an infant on his belly. The next day I had to go into, the town, into town and make a report to the forestry department along with Johnny, my head field assistant, and so my other field assistant followed the chimps and I told them that night about Mike's behavior. So he kept an eye on Mike as well as Tia. Mike did the same thing the next day. Now as far as we know, Mike is not related to Tia and Amy. Um, he's unlikely to have been the father of Amy, given that he was probably only eight years old when Amy was conceived. There are perhaps um, a number of explanations uh, for this behavior that hopefully we can explore more when we look at the genetic relatedness of individuals and this sort of thing. Um, and while it might not be what we call true altruistic behavior, truly selfless behavior, and again this is something that most people attribute only to humans, I think that you can't argue that Mike understood the needs of Tia and the infant and that he acted on on this, so it is some sort of, of empathy. Now I've talked about a number of different behaviors exhibited by the fungal chimps, and most of the ones I've talked about are, are behaviors that distinguish them from chimps elsewhere, and I'm part of a, a large project called the Chimpanzee Culture Project that looks specifically at this question, and it addresses the issue of culture and not human primates. Again, many people even today consider culture to be only human. By definition, humans have culture and other animals don't. But we do, I believe, see at least some rudimentary type of culture in chimpanzees and other animals as well. And this figure from National Geographic illustrates some of the differences that we see. It's apparent that the savanna environment at Fongoli brings about some of the behaviors that we see. It's also apparent that I think that West African chimps differ from chimps in East Africa, so we should redefine chimpanzees. And whenever we find something new about chimpanzees, I think it's, I think it's great, because this, again, is probably the, the animal that's been studied the most in the world. And um, just to know that we can still find new things out about chimpanzees, I think, is very inspiring. And something, though, that, um, that, that we should also keep in mind as we deal with some very tough conservation problems. I'm going to make this my last slide before I show you a video. And um, I like the symbolism of this slide. I'll tell you what it is. So I, I talked to you about how my study of chimpanzees can help us shed light on some of the aspects of the very earliest hominids, the earliest members of our own lineage. But I want to reiterate that while I think chimpanzees are much more similar to humans in many aspects of their behavior and cognition that many people are aware, I don't think of them as living fossils by any means. But it's like this photo, one of my favorite chimpanzees. This is Frito. We call him Frito anyway. And he's hanging above the water at Sokoto Pool. You can see his image there in the water. Uh, this image of Frito is wavy, and it gives a somewhat distorted view of his face. But if you look closely, you can see the chimpanzee in the water. And that's the analogy that I'd like to make. When we see chimps living today, we know they're not human. They're not necessarily what the very earliest hominids looked like. But they are an image that resonates with humanity. So I'd like to show you a, a brief film that um, illustrates some of the behaviors. I think it's, it says a lot to be able to see these chimpanzees. If, if I can have that film. Yep. Yeah. It's the chimp tool use. Hello everyone, welcome to the show. I'm Boyd Matson. We begin in the African country of Senegal, where the discovery of woodland chips sharpening sticks and using them like spears to hunt has rocked the world of primatology. The story is part of our ongoing series involving National Geographic's Emerging Explorers. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, definitely, again, thank you to the Houston Museum of Natural Science, the Leakey Foundation. A number of people have supported my work. 
throughout the years. I couldn't do this without a very large team, and I want to give a special thanks to my brother and my mom and dad who came respectively from San Antonio and Yoakum, Texas tonight to see me. So thank you again very much. We have time for a few questions. Do we have any in the audience in the back here? Have you seen the make weapons for defense against predators? I haven't seen many predator interactions. Um, I've seen interactions with dogs. There are spotted hyenas there. I've seen them brandish weapons against each other, um, usually sticks. So they will hit usually at each other. They won't. This is something Richard Rangham has seen in East Africa. So they'll actually hit. I think in that case it was males hitting females. I've definitely seen them brandish weapons at each other. They they throw rocks more often. And they use sticks. They throw rocks a lot directly at one another, and that includes all age sex groups. Oftentimes, the young boys seem to do that a lot. Um, and that's actually that's a really interesting behavior that I'd love to have a student look more closely at because they 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 have you know they use particular hands. They're right handed and left handed, but they can let, definitely direct. The young Frito there that I showed at the very end, he's really good at directing rocks at new observers that I bring out. It's like an initiation. But so, yeah, I've seen a couple of different things, but interaction with the big predators, I haven't seen. I imagine that these days we probably scare off some of these predators. Some hyenas are probably laying low during the day. There's a, a leopard. We have evidence for a leopard that comes through every once in a while, but lions have been exterminated from the area. Um, so, yeah, I just haven't gotten a chance to see it yet. Next question, right here. Have any DNA data showing uh, how much separation there is between the eastern and western chimps? Is there DNA data for separation between the eastern and western chimps? Yeah, and that's a really good question because some people maintain that actually West African chimps, so the various subspecies, should be raised to species status. And the, the data from Fungolia, on, on one side, is definitely environmental effects. But on another level, it supports what Christoph Bosch has been finding at Thai Forest and um, Matsuzawa at Basu and Guinea. We just don't have that many samples from studies of chimps you know, outside of East Africa. But there's definitely uh, genetic data that supports it. And again, it depends on what, your, uh, what criteria you want to use. Um, and then this, these behavioral data support it as well. So I, I'm leaning... I'm leaning that way. They definitely interbreed in captivity, but then again, so the Borneo and Sumatra and orangutan. So there's definitely that. That's that case is made, and I probably would support it at this point, given the behavioral data. We're actually doing some genetics on these guys. Or a PhD student is doing some genetic work on on these guys right now. She's she's still working on it. Uh, of course, the, the big separation is the bonobos and chimps across the Congo. But just east and west, there's so much geography. Is that distance similar in impact to the Congo River? Okay. Let me try to get this one. Um, is the distance factor a factor in the separation? Well, I think you see a bigger difference between, but again, we sort of consider chimpanzees as a chimpanzee, and there's no typical chimpanzee. Our typical chimpanzee is an East African chimpanzee right now, I think. And um, but there's there's definitely a, a greater difference between bonobos and and perhaps and even West African chimpanzees than there is between West and East African chimpanzees, if that if that makes sense. But you know, I, I sort of see some of this behavior as um, on a continuum rather than really discrete differences. And I think it's really interesting to look at this this idea of um, lethal aggression, aggression versus affiliation, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's definitely something that I'm going to continue studying for the next several years. Up here in the back. Yes. Um, you mentioned the genetic studies. What is the focus of your genetic studies in this population? What is the focus of the genetic studies in this population? Well, I actually have a student from Cambridge. She had come out to my site, and then she got into graduate school. Um, she's looking at social behavior and nesting behavior specifically. So we follow chimpanzees all day long. When I'm out there, I'll be at a chimpanzee and make a, a new night nest, almost every night. Sometimes they reuse nests, but so they, they sleep in a nest or a bed in the trees that they make, sometimes on the ground. 
and we'll follow them all day long until they make another one. Sometimes they'll make one an hour before the sun sets, other times they make one after dark. Um, so it's a little hard to actually, you know, see how everyone um, situates themselves, the, the spatial pattern. And so she's looking at using genetic data to determine patterns of nesting behavior. And then another thing that she's doing for me is to look at paternity. And so I had a, a master's student specifically look at male immature interactions a couple of years ago, and I continued to collect data on that. So you don't have paternal care. Mike, that was a different, that was a very different type of example. You, you don't see that, we've never seen that type of thing. It's a few times we've seen males move to protect an infant, and we see a lot of play with infants. But so, just affiliation and play is something that we're going to look at with paternity. But I think that she's finding some interesting mitochondrial, um, matrilineal lineage, um, at least differences between what you see elsewhere, but that may be an artifact of a lack of dispersal opportunities. We're not sure. They've just found the same thing for a population of, of chips in Guinea. So we have a number of different things. I'm really interested in the paternity data. Pamela, are you? What is the difference in bonobos and chips, the primary difference? What's the primary difference between bonobos and chips? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> if I want to be really general, um, <clears throat> bonobos are the lovers, chimpanzees are the fighters. So that is really general. I hate to even say that, being a chip person. So bonobos have a very unique way of dealing with stress, social stress, and that is they have sex. They have a lot of sex, a lot of different ways, with a lot of different age sex classes. It is just amazing. Probably only second to humans, at least among primates. So I should have brought bonobos into my talk. But uh, chimps are not quite the same way. In general, chimps are seen as definitely more aggressive. Um, and you don't see the same lethal aggression between bonobo communities. In fact, when bonobo communities come together, you see sex. Um, but again, this is something that seems to differ to some degree between West and East African chimps. But we just have had so few samples from West Africa. But yeah, so lovers, fighters would be the real general the real general way of distinguishing those. But there's there's a lot of overlap, too. Anyone way in the corner? Do you have a hypothesis for why there are higher incidences of the females and immature males experimenting? What are the adult males doing? What are the adult males doing? Doing everybody else is hurting. Yeah. The adult males are not doing, no. Um, they... <laughs> Well, my, I had a few, a few different hypotheses, and I'm not really happy with any of them right now, especially since we see a few more males exhibiting this behavior. Again, if I continue to see this pattern, then I will probably rethink, um, you know, the, how long this, this behavior has been within the group. It may be that the males are just now learning it. They are the last, typically the last age sex class to pick up a new behavior, so maybe that's the case. But in terms of access to meat, I mean, females, all the females at my site either have, except for one older one, either have an input on their belly or on their back. And physically, they're not going to be able to catch monkeys like males can. I have seen an adult female with a bushbuck fawn. That's something that they could acquire. And to me, it's just a creative way of getting at a meat source that these adult males can't. One thing I did point out was that we have two adolescent males that were actually ranked pretty high on the tool assisted hunting graph. And they've just been observed. This is the first year that they've successfully hunted monkeys on their own. And so it'll be interesting to watch them. Will they give up this behavior now that they can hunt monkeys? It's not a very costly behavior. This tool, um, tool assisted hunting, is not very costly. There is some skill involved. And I will say that one of the adult males, actually the male that exhibited it the most three times, Bilbo, did a very poor job of it in one instance. It didn't even take the leaves off the branches. I hate to even say that because it's embarrassing. But <laughs> he ruined my whole standardized steps because he's the only one that's ever done that. Um, but so, so I'm, the jury's still out, but I have a number of, of different ideas. I think it's, it's a way they can get access to meat. And also, they, they, the meat is not taken from them. They can, um, you know, they actually will share some of uh, this bush baby capture, even though it's a tiny little package of meat, they'll ask, actually dole out food, usually to their offspring, but also to other individuals. 
In Jay, right here. Um, you said earlier that they would share meat but not plant food. Why? Which, mm -hmm. Why would they? Why wouldn't they share meat not plant food? Mm -hmm. It's usually thought that meat is a very hot commodity. It's a very high quality food. Well, it's, it's a desirable food. But there are a number of different hypotheses about why they share meat. And one is the meat for sex hypothesis. Um, that's been pr proposed by some. Some have found, though, that uh, this relates to just begging effort. So the more you beg, the more likely you are to get food. But um, it's definitely seen by some primatologists as um, a so actually a social behavior, that it has more of a social function than a nutritional function. Uh, plant food, um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely less desirable. It's usually, for the most part, easy to obtain. Almost every chimp can have access. So there's definitely, um, you know, dominance issues. Adult males are going to get access to the best foods if, if they desire, but that's not such an issue. And, and meat is a very different, it's, as a food, it's distributed very differently in space and time. I think that's the main reason. Another one right here? Can you just briefly describe uh, a male captures a vermin monkey through some kind of honey exercise and shares? A female gets a bush baby through the spear and shares. What's the difference between who gets shared with? Who does the adult male share with and who does the female share with? Well, the female almost always shares with her own, own offspring. I've actually seen that some females ignore their offspring. Um, males will share with other males. They'll also share with some females. Um, individuals of both sexes ignore other individuals. And that's something that we have, uh, we just started working on to try to look at patterns. And again, when relatedness, when we find out relatedness, we can look at some of these. Um, these two adolescent males that just captured the very young monkey actually were around adult males and they effectively ignored the adult males. Didn't give them any meat. Uh, they sort of left the dregs and then you pick up a tail or something like this. But the one pattern that we can pick out right now is that females share with their offspring more often than others. But um, one thing we try to do is look at individual differences. So we could pool males and pool females and look at it that way, but there are definitely differences in rank that need to be taken into account. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of individual variation. So we, we really, you know, same story, I guess. Always like a larger sample size. But right now the, the, the offspring, that's, that's definitely a pattern that you see between females and offspring. Great. Can you tell us the young males are learning from mom for hunting bush babies? The males that we've seen hunting definitely have mothers that hunt. And so Frito, in the, at the end of the pool, Frito hunts. His mother, Frappa, is one of the adult females that we see hunting. And David, his, his older brother that's now an adolescent, um, also is one of the, the hunters that we see. But you know, almost all the individuals hunt. Not not every single one, but most of the individuals hunt in the in the community. But I was relating this earlier. I, I had an example last year of um, a great mix of trial and error learning, and what I assume is learning based on mother's behavior. And so, Frito's little sister Fanta was two years old at the time, and she was sorry three years old, and she was experimenting with hunting with a tool. And she first, uh, it's like a story of the three bears, she broke off a tool that was too short, and, and she would modify it. What was really interesting is she would modify it, I assume based on what she'd seen her mother do, but so she would trim it with her teeth, but not in the appropriate, appropriate place. I was able to retrieve it, and she trimmed it so much in one, in one spot that it sort of went limp. And so she would exhibit this behavior that I'm sure she saw her mother, I've seen her on her mother when her mother is jabbing. Um, I don't know if she could see very well then, but so she's observed others, but then she, um, you know, discarded the tool that was too short, she got another tool that was just right, I thought, and was stabbing it, and then she discarded that, got one that was too long, and then it got caught up in the vines, it, it was just a really interesting process, and of course there was no camera that day, <laughs> but um, it was a mix of trial and error and what I assume was observational learning, but it's very difficult, but we can look at some correlations between, for example, that sharpening of the tip, the trimming of the tip, not everyone does that. And so Tumbo Tia does it, Nickel. Um, 
the most successful hunters actually own. Um, but so it would be interesting to see what, and then again, those are the ones that had the debates this year to see what their offspring do as well. And, and the other issue is like Parafa, is this, this older female, um, she's, she's fairly well habituated, but we don't see her as often or as up close as these younger females who have sort of grown up with us or just another part of the landscape. I'm sure that uh, doing your research requires a lot of patience. Can you give us an estimate of how much, what percentage of the time that you sit there is actually observing really interesting things? I think he thinks it might be boring. <laughs> but how much time I have spent watching something interesting and how much spent just sitting? For me, like, 99.9% is watching really interesting. I think it's interesting when they're sleeping or anything. And partly I think because, well, I just love chimpanzees, but partly it took, so it took four years to habituate them to our presence. And that wasn't me solid for four years. That was my team and me when I could get over there as often as I could, but Johnny, my field assistant. Um, so I'm still excited that the chimps are here. They're not leaving forever to go away to Mali or somewhere like that. So um, I'm excited when they're sleeping. So the um, average person, perhaps, oh, I don't know. That's hard to say. I don't know. I really don't know um, what the average person thinks is exciting about chimps. But, I mean, you know, you can go for, when I go back there in May, June, that's when the hunting season starts, and I might see tool assisted hunting every day. And that's, so you're always on the verge of, you know, something exciting that's going on. But just so, especially with 10 males, it could pretty, be pretty darn exciting when there's that's just female around. There's a lot of displays and that sort of thing. But I stick with the 99.9% of it. There is one more. Are there? Is the history of chimps in that area? Have they been there forever? Do you know the history of the chimps in that area? They've, they've been there forever, basically. Yeah, it's, or, you know, we don't know exact details, um, but they, it's, it's not a habitat they've moved into um, fairly recently or anything like that. And it's interesting because there is um, a primatologist, Tony Goldberg, who studied chimpanzee genetics, and he actually maintains, based on his idea of forest refuge and variation in, in chimpanzee subspecies and species, that uh, chimps were probably more more of a woodland species than a forest species. Like we think of them today, that in the past they probably didn't have it a wider geographical range. Um, but, you know, as far as I know, they've been there for a very long time. And it really is the northern, I didn't mention this when I showed the map, but it is the northern and westernmost limits of their range, especially the northern limits. It's, it's really, you know, too much further north and it's just too hot and dry. There are just a few tiny patches of forest. So, I think 1%, literally between 1 and 3%. And, uh, but those are crucial because they have these water sources. So that, that's, the, that's key is these tiny bits of galley force, but you move much beyond that and you, and you don't have it. But, you know, I, it's, it's interesting to me because I have these expectations based on what I've read about chimps and forest habitat. Since I was telling this story today, my field assistant emailed me one time and said, I think Lucille's going to have a baby. I said, no, she's not. She's not due to have another baby that, that you know, she needs to wait another year according to the literature. Um, what would be held if you had a baby? And I thought this, you know, given this, what I see is a very harsh environment for chimpanzees, um, I expected to see long periods between births and um, just a number of, of behaviors, biological behaviors, that I'm surprised at. And so that's, it's, all, it's, it's interesting, because I think I'm pretty open-minded, but a, a couple of times I said, no, you know, I'm, I can't believe you see all. Tell her to read the books, but you know, it's hard. <laughs> Back here in the back? Is there physical contact with the chimps? Now, that's a good question. So, I have a real conservative protocol, and um, most study sites do these days, and so I think it down gets like seven meters, five to seven meters. Um, so, you know, minimum 10 feet, but usually like 15 feet between yourself and the ape, and, and not necessarily not only because of the fact that they're very strong and they can pull you around and hurt you, but mainly because of the, the, the fact that we know now we can transmit disease to them very easily, and this has happened a number of times, um, we now know. And so I have um, my research protocol 
is that we keep 30 feet from the chimpanzees, 10 meters. And I always say that the chips don't read the research protocol. So they will come closer these days, especially these younger, like Frito, will come within, you know, a 10 feet of me and throw a rock at somebody. That happens to come for the first day, that's their initiation, and then he stops. He doesn't do it again. Um, and I've had, uh, I've had a few adult males display at me, but we don't have any contact. As far as I know, no one's told me that they have had contact. We haven't had any contact, except with Amy. I carried baby Amy out. That was pretty amazing, pretty surreal. I couldn't believe I was carrying Tia's baby out to her. Um, I had a mask on. Um, I had to sanitize my hands with antibacterial. But we don't have we don't have any contact. We really discourage that. And also, because these chimps live alongside people, if they lose their fear of people, that could be really hazardous for them. And um, the chimps on my site don't cooperate. They're afraid of other people. They know us, and if someone comes with me, they're okay. If they're a little far away from me, they're not so sure, but they're okay because they're with me. But we see other people, pe people from the village or someone walking by, and we all have to hide or move away for a little uh, ways, things like that. But um, Fanta, in the video, Fanta was a little chimp. She was two at the time. She had a leaf. She was looking, and then she was looking at a reflection. Fanta is very naughty these days because she's very well habituated. Her mother is very tolerant. Her brother, Frito, is quite naughty as well. And Fanta, well, actually one year, I was there last year, this time of year, I had the semester over there, and she would approach me, she actually approached me and presented one, so I just have to ignore her. I was very flattered. But I had to ignore her, and she knew that I would leave once she got too close, and so she started sneaking up on me. And the only reason I knew she was there is I would see I was sitting underneath the tree or trying to find some shade and there were a few leaves that would fall down around me and look at Fanta would be there. And she was very, very quiet about getting right there as close as she could, like a game to her, but and then I'd have to leave. And her mother, I would you know, I even made a point of trying to get her mother's attention, thinking that her mother would be upset and I even hooed, you know, whoo, your baby's over here. She could get eaten by me or something. Mother doesn't care. She's she used to me. But so that's the that's the problem. And that that's something definitely that we have to worry about. The you know, is these younger individuals. We just don't want any contact with them at all. And we definitely never want them to know how strong they are. Yeah. Yeah, still have some more? Are you? Do you know the differences between the human genome and the chimp genome? I'm sorry. Specifics. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to say that I don't know the specifics. You know, there's a number. There's a number of interesting. I'm sure I couldn't dredge it up right now. I'm a little tired, but <laughs> there are a number of interesting areas and genes actually that they they've started to focus on, and I'm just not up um, with the literature like I should be. But no, that's that's some very interesting work that's that's been going on lately. And now the Neanderthal genome has been completed as well. Let's see. Are you? because they don't scavenge very much, hardly ever. I haven't seen it in my site. I really pay attention to their behavior after the grass fires because monkeys will scavenge little insects or take advantage of insects. I mean, we can see it with the grass fire birds. A number of animals will take advantage of that type of situation, or at least after the grass fire has moved through, they'll move in. The chimps haven't done this. Um, and I haven't, I've seen them. I've actually got some film later out of this. I don't take much film. Uh, I just started recently. But... Um, they found a dead patus monkey, and they were very interested in it. I actually have that up on YouTube. I had posted it for a class. I did a distance class. Um, you could, so you can see that if you do a search for fungoli chimps. And so they saw this dead patus monkey. At first, there was a lot of warning barking. They were very nervous around it. Everyone was very cautious. There was even some semi-pyloretrin where the hair was standing up. And then they would, I don't know how they did it because it was very smelly at the point, but they would smell it. Um, they took a very long time to investigate it. So I have, been seeing, I have seen them come across dead animals. That was pretty far gone. 
Um, but I've seen them actually just in January when I was when I was there. I came across a dead mongoose, a banded mongoose. Um, it was a little bloated, so a little off. But um, we have seen Tia, whose infant was taken, Tia on the magnet. Tia actually killed an eight abandoned banded mongoose. That's the only time we've ever seen that actually anywhere with chimps. And so it is on their diet, it is on their list. Um, but in fact, it was um, a juvenile female sort of gave these kind of uh, distress vocalizations, not, not quite warning marks, but sort of like, oh, what is that? Sort of afraid type of vocalizations that this dead mongoose. So I've seen them encounter a few dead things, but I haven't yet seen scavenging. And it really, you know, these sites where chips have been studied almost 50 years, there's very few instances of scavenging. So that is, that is a really interesting difference between chips and the earliest hominids. Um, okay. Um, right here. Yeah. When it comes to mating, how do they prevent of mating, you know, brother with sister or father? Have you observed um, <coughs> mating in brothers and sisters and okay. fathers? And yeah. You know, they have to go maybe to another colony, mm -hmm. young ladies. Yeah, so um, like inbreeding, avoidance. Yeah. And yeah. Usually in chimpanzees, females leave the, the natal community. Um, they don't always leave. So if you remember Jane Goodall's chimps, Fifi was Flo's daughter. Fifi stayed in that community and actually became the highest ranking female and produced a large number of offspring. Um, Nickel, I don't know if I pointed out Nickel, but Nickel is a female in, in the video that had a tiny baby. And Nickel actually stayed in the natal community, in the Fugbilly community. So her mother, uh, Nene, is there. So Kava has her granddaughter. So we have a little family there that we can watch uh, uh, maternal lineage. What you do see is avoidance, usually, um, of mating between maternal siblings. But for the most part, this female dispersal is the norm, and that how, that's how in, in breeding is avoided. But that's definitely something that the student is, is looking at with the, these, uh, the mitochondrial DNA specifically, because it does seem that at least what she's seen so far is that we have more female chimps staying put. And again, I think that might be due to lack of dispersal opportunities. Marie? Uh, you were mentioning your research protocol, and I was just curious. I haven't read many drill articles on primatology. Are you bound by the same sort of responsibilities to um, report breaches of your protocol? Obviously, they're done by the chimps probably more so than you. But I mean, I know if I leave the lid off of a jar of fruit flies and have to escape, I have to report. Is there any reporting with your research protocols and if there's any breaches in the protocols? Yeah. Well, um, I guess it, it, we definitely talk about, well, for example, um, it wasn't until recently that I began to focus on social behavior. That's not necessarily a breach of my protocol or anything, but it's just my assessment of habituation. And so, you know, two years after our, we began the study, I could follow some individuals for most of the day, but it wasn't confident that the behavior I collected wasn't, that, that it was uh, an accurate presentation of, of, you know, their normal behavior because of the effect that we were having on them. So the same with the females right now. I mean, I know I'm under reporting female hunting, but that's something that I say in my article. But, you know, in terms of breach of protocol, that's something that I think uh, at least I'm more familiar with what folks that say chefs are doing. And there's been a real movement by a number of primatologists, including Jay Goodall and Christoph Bosch especially, to really standardize these research protocols because mainly of disease. And so Christoph Bosch at the Max Planck, he studies chimps in Ivory Coast, has helped establish the grade eight health monitoring unit. And um, there are a set of guidelines. And so I use a pretty conservative guideline, like the distance between myself and chimps. Mine's actually longer than they, I think, are a further distance. But I can, I can do that, too, because we don't have so many trees. <laughs> um, uh, the grass makes it pretty horrible. But so it's, it's more of sort of um, a responsibility I think primatologists have taken. Definitely, if there's some you know, incident that affects the data collection, you either throw that out. I mean, it's a different type of situation. It usually comes out. But um, as far as health guidelines and, and research standards, that's something that kind of decided to do and, and, um, and try to standardize anyway and publish that and, 
newsletters. I um, mean, you know, they get that in journal articles and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering about Amy uh, and how often the, uh, the young kids get captured. Um, he's thinking about Amy and he's wondering how many, uh -huh. how often the young kids get captured. You know, I, I talked with some folks who um, specialize, I guess, study specifically grade 8 reintroduction. There's not a whole lot of it. But as far as chips go, there's not another example that we have like this. Because at least this, and, and we're, we're writing a little paper on it, and we're calling it a return, really, rather than a reintroduction. Um, usually, in the very few cases where chips have been reintroduced, they're orphans who lived in a sanctuary in Africa for a while, and then they're released to an, an, what we call sometimes an empty forest or an island where there are no other chimps. They're taught how to, how to live, um, forage in some cases. But in this particular type of case, I don't think there's any other example, partly, mainly because the mothers are usually killed. And then I, I have talked to a woman who works in West Africa, Janice Carter. She's taken infants back to a wild population three different times, once in Senegal, and um, at least two of those cases, she knew it wasn't the NATO group, and the mothers had also been killed. So this is a really different type of situation. It really is. A, I just have to say miraculous because everything sort of fell into place, and the, the mother's health was the big issue. Otherwise, we couldn't have put her back. She was just too young. Um, and then the fact that, that we can follow them. I mean, one thing that was amazing to me is the chimps. You know, I think I mentioned when, when, I, when it showed me in that video that we were based on, again, what this woman had told me about her experience with the chimps. We were afraid that the males would be upset. You know, you can't blame them, really. Um, someone their, has their baby that was taken brutally. So we all three went together because there were eight adult males there with Tia and another female or two. And they did not, they were not upset in the least. They were just attentive to the baby. There was no pilo erection, there was no raw barking, nothing at all like that. And that was amazing to me. So it was very different. And now, <laughs> I've shifted focus now. We still follow males, of course, and I don't target females, but we follow the males that are in the party with Tia <laughs> because I want to keep an eye on her. And so we've been keeping an eye on her for almost two months. And I said, we'll just continue to do this for the next year. But both are doing fine. I'm always worried. When I get a call that something happened, but as far as I know, it's the only in the only case. It's just such a uh, sort of bizarre scenario.